Good evening. My name is Trish Gibbons, and I am a member of the Greater Kane County Chapter of Wild Ones. Welcome to the first presentation of the 2023 series, Under Our Feet. Under Our Feet is the third annual series presented in partnership with the Greater Kane County Wild Ones and the Gail Borden Public Library. And joining the partnership this year is the Elgin Sustainability Commission. If you are new to native gardening, you can obtain a certificate of participation that you can redeem at the Greater Kane County um, Wild Ones Native Plant Sale in May. Pre-order forms for the plant sale will be made available to members in late January. This will allow them the benefit of special pricing for native trees, uh, shrubs, flowers, and grasses. And there will be a public sale in May also. Wild One's next meeting will be made available to members in January, will uh, be this year's, excuse me, annual movie night scheduled for Monday, January 23rd at 6.30 p.m. at the Gail Borden Library. And finally, whether you're looking for inspiration, information, or intentional planting ideas, please visit our startintheyard.com website. The website has all our previous programs available for viewing, along with a lot of information and direction related to native plants and natural landscapes. Again, that website is startinyouryard.com. And now let's turn to Jean Muntz who will introduce our speaker. Under our feet. Well, if your question is why soil, how about some attention grabbing info from the experts who study such things? They say, despite all our accomplishments, we owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Yet, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the surface of the earth. When you gather one teaspoon of soil, you have one of the most complex living systems on earth. And in that teaspoon, there are more organisms than people on Earth. 150 years ago, there was an average of 12% carbon in our soil, whereas today, the amount of carbon in depleted farmland and grassland averages 1%. It is not the land that is broken. It is our relationship to it. Tonight, we begin the four session deeper dive into all of this, we welcome Carter O'Brien, who is currently a scientific associate at the Field Museum, where from 1997 to just last fall, he was the Field Museum's sustainability officer. He says one of his most meaningful and impactful projects was stewarding the transformation of the Field Museum's grounds from concrete and turf grass into the rice native gardens, including the museum's edible treasures staff community garden and establishing an iNaturalist project to highlight and document improvements to biodiversity on that campus. This past fall, he left for a new position at Chicago's Department of Streets and Sanitation, where he now focuses on policy and operations relating to recycling composting and other forms of waste diversion. I invite you to read more about Mr. O'Brien's fascinating life on our startinyouryard.com website, because we can't wait any longer to hear the story Carter has to tell us about the Field Museum Rice Native Gardens. Well, thank you. <laughs> wow, that was that was very humbling. I sound much better coming from uh, your your take than mine. Honestly, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for having me today. This is uh, truly an honor and a privilege to be invited. I am uh, not a soil scientist, but I am very much a soil enthusiast. 
And I've very much been, uh, I think, um, eagerly embracing the reality that a lot of uh, what we're doing here on, on Earth really not only involves the soil, but that we do indeed need to repair our relationship to it. And that can actually even start with repairing the soil itself right under our feet. So I think I'm a pretty good fit for this particular uh, series. Um, starting off with the, the picture that we've got here, on the left, you might recognize this is a, a rather large display panel that is actually in the Field Museum at the end of the uh, Hall of Conservation, uh, Restoring Earth. And it, you might not be able to see exactly, but under the, the fellow's outline, that is um, basically the uh, turf grass. And to give you an idea of how deep the roots are when compared to all these lovely prairie plants. And then of course, we've got a little bit of a fade of the Field Museum there. Um, a little bit about me. I had to dig deep to find a, a photo that I thought was about as far removed from soil and gardens as I could find, and it was pretty simple. Uh, this was the park across the street from my house where I grew up. It was called Coal Yard Park because it used to be a coal yard, and it caught on fire, and there were some explosions in the 60s, apparently, and so they paved it over, threw up a basketball rim, some interesting equipment, as you can see, and renamed it Coal Yard Park. Can't say I ever really thought too much about uh, what was actually going on down there. You know, I mean, it was an open space. Uh, that's actually a meatpacking plant that's on the other side of it. This is located about a mile from Wrigley Field on an old uh, train spur line. So it is absolutely fair to say that I uh, was very much a giant blank slate when it came to all of this discussion um, when I started at the Field Museum in 1997. So I'm going to back it up uh, a little bit. Um, well, actually, one, one more slide on this, which is just to show like why the Field Museum is such a great story, I think, for a lot of people is that, you know, we all grow up with, if not the Field Museum or the Shed or MSI, the Sable museums that are, you know, maybe closer to where you are if you're in the western part of the state. I love the Mississippi River uh, Museum that's uh, across the river in Iowa. But just to show, like, I still use this bag for camping. So, you know, all of these sort of trips as a kid really had a huge impact on me. And I hope that I'm able to sort of give something back and, you know, make these visits uh, equally enjoyable and memorable for other people as I move forward through life. So uh, a little inspiration then for this story is that in... Uh, it, it had already been up for a couple of years here, but this is the uh, Chicago Park District Garden, actually, that surrounds uh, the totem pole that is on the north side of the Field Museum overlooking Grant Park. And one of uh, the wonderful people that set this up later came to join our staff, and she was just a huge uh, impact and inspiration to me as we took on the project. And this this sort of became our, our lodestone. You know, we, we decided, like, we really want the entire uh, museum grounds and really we want the entire museum campus to kind of resemble this. And now I'm going to show you what we started with to give you an idea, idea of what's that, what that has actually involved. Um, so it's going kind of way back to the early sort of, you know, development of, of Chicago as a, as a hub of commerce and uh, lots of people, right? So this is looking at uh, Chicago, obviously from Lake Michigan, looking west. But I want to zoom in specifically uh, on this. This is an actual um, railroad train that is up on trestles. This is where Grant Park is today and Millennium Park. And this uh, sort of deal with the devil, so to speak, that the city made back in the day with the railroad really is, is what sets the, the sort of stage for this entire story. So you've got the Chicago River, which is, you know, like the major port as uh, everything is coming in. The railroad wants to connect the port with the growing uh, sort of industrial sort of operations that are starting to happen actually further south. And they decide that uh, they are willing to construct a breakwater for the city if the city will give them um, access rights. Those access rights are still there today. Uh, Grant Park, Millennium Park, et cetera, ends up getting built over it in the long run. But slowly but surely, what is happening is that you have sort of like the lakefront getting filled in. And when they're filling it in, they're using uh, what they describe back then as construction spoil largely, which is essentially when you're excavating any of the uh, very large buildings that you know were going up very rapidly in the city. They've got a great place to put it. They're filling the lake. They're trying to create a park. 
And then at the same time, the railroad is kind of starting to take a little bit of ownership as well of, of its um, allotted kind of space. And they start adding tracks and kind of like widening out uh, what they have. I will uh, just add one other quick thing. When I first started putting this um, slides together showing this kind of time period, I, I sort of assumed uh, very naively and ignorantly that this is maybe something to do with like the technology of the time. And I've been assured by more than a few photographers um, who tell me, no, that this is just the air. So this is what Chicago was like back then. And it kind of helps to explain why uh, fresh air, fresh water, and even a little bit of, of turf grass was considered so valuable back then. So here's the same park uh, 25 years later. This is following the Chicago fire. And you can see that, you know, the idea of a park back then, I mean, it's just, it's just grass and even just a few little trees. And this was, you know, a huge part of Chicago's kind of reason for being was that it had carved out this space that was um, forever uh, clear and free for the usage of the people. So then we fast forward a little bit to, to move to where the Field Museum ends up. So this is um, kind of the space that they, they created for the Field Museum. It's a very long story that's a different presentation where we talk about how the field was going to end up originally um, in Daniel Burnham's mind, kind of where Buckingham Fountain is. And then there was a sort of epic series of lawsuits by Montgomery Ward who wanted to keep the park free. And so they came up with a compromise of uh, creating some, some more of this parkland. Uh, at the very southern end. So this is kind of where Roosevelt, if it kind of went through, would be right about here. Here are the actual pilings for the museum itself. It is literally built in the lake. These pilings go down as far as 90 or 95 feet before they found uh, something sturdy, some, you know, some bedrock that they could build this thing on. Uh, I do ask you to pay attention to the dates, how fast all of these things are happening back at this time period is absolutely astonishing. So Here's just you know months later, and you can see what they have done in terms of filling like all of the area around the museum. You can see that there's sort of like this uh, train cars that are on the bottom along with the crane. Uh, what we're pretty sure that is happening is that the train is kind of going a little bit, you know, as far as it can get. They dump all of the cars sideways, and then they're they're literally using you know kind of human labor. Um, uh, people carts with shovels, et cetera, to just kind of smooth it all out. You can tell by what you're looking at, this is not any sort of consistent material. This is uh, more of the construction spoil I mentioned, as well as construction debris. Um, we do unfortunately have to tell people at this point that the story that we are built on the rubble of the Chicago fire is not actually true. The Chicago fire was um, in 1971, that was, uh, or 1871, excuse me, that was many, many, many years before this happened. So this is literally all material that is being produced as they are using it to fill the space. And how this is getting done, so that train is actually coming uh, from the downtown area. It is in a tunnel that is all the way at the bottom of this picture. It's, uh, it says Illinois Freight Tunnel, if your vision is better than mine, and you can read that. And so what is happening is that this um, these freight trains are literally loading up with pretty much anything that somebody wants to get rid of. And they are taking it all the way to sort of the end of that freight tunnel line to a spur that goes to the museum, now museum campus. And they are just unloading it nonstop to, uh, you know, build the actual sort of site that the museum is resting on. So now we've got 1919. You can see, you know, how fast this is all moving. You can also just see how unbelievably chaotic it all looks, like the material itself. What you're looking at that is... Um, kind of up uh, up across the center middle, a little to the left. That's the freight um, freight tunnel line that I mentioned. And they what they did was they capped it off. And the idea was that after they finished kind of the building, uh, the, the irony today with the sort of amount of traffic we have, but they didn't want to, um, I believe the quote is, they didn't want to mar the landscape with truck traffic, delivering coal and also um, having to pick up the ash and take the ash away. So they figured, we're gonna use this freight tunnel system that we've built. It's gonna show up, it's gonna bring coal for the building and then it's gonna haul uh, the ash away. So what we've got then is sort of like this mystery substance that all of this is sitting on. And it, over the years, people have assumed it was either highly toxic, they've assumed it was full of lots of rubble and debris from the Chicago fire. And a lot of us, I think, grew up just not thinking about it at all, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I mean, it just, it 
they covered it with kind of grass. It kind of looked like a park. Uh, Chicago is, is a, a place that takes a long time to really understand how far you kind of can peel down to get some really interesting layers of the onion. Um, but in 1927, we start to see the first evidence of uh, what became sort of were known as like the iconic like front lawns of the building. To the best of my record, like it, this is about as early as I could find in any archives anywhere to show um, as the grass lawns start to go in. And they're going to be there all the way up until the, you know, the project that, that I'm here to speak to you about. 1933, it's more of the same. You can see um, how heavy the rail presence here is really starting to get. <clears throat> I think this is probably also where you start to get the idea of um, uh, Lakeshore Drive, Mount DeSable Lakeshore Drive, kind of wrapping around the Field Museum. If anyone ever finds uh, evidence of who actually put that plan together, I would love to hear it. I cannot find a lick of it. All we know is that it happened, and it happened pretty quickly after the museum was built, and that was just something everybody learned to live with. So I'm going to fast forward a bit here, because um, I don't want to spend too long in this part, but in 1979, this is what we see. You can, again, sort of see, you know, these sort of just turf uh, turf lawns going around the building. You can also see, I think, a little bit, if, if you kind of go on the edges, you'll see it looks really kind of worn down very much like a Chicago Parkway um, where people get out of the cars and they just compactorize the soil. They wear, wear any grass, flowers that someone has planted away quite often. And we think what was really happening here, go back, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, move forward to this one, is that this was a free parking lot for decades, the North parking lot. And we're thinking what probably was happening is people park in the lot, even when they're going to Soldier Field or they're going to another part of the campus. And they just get used to walking, kind of hugging close to the, the building itself of the field. So it becomes, you know, what sometimes is called a desire path, a cow path. And the, the, the weird part about all this is that it creates kind of like an unusual culture at the campus, which was between the Soldier Field events and kind of the traffic and the, the foot traffic, um, there was sort of like a, a common wisdom when I started there in 1997, which was we don't really bother with the landscaping because what's the point? It's just going to sort of get trampled between the sports fans and the museum attendees and festival goers. So, you know, we just kind of deal with this turf grass. We know it's, you know, maybe not ideal, but it's grass. Everybody loves grass. Um, and then I uh, revisit just very quickly because this is going to close this this part of the presentation then is that uh, loop loop floods because they're doing some work kind of roughly where the Trump Tower building is now on the river and somebody punctures that freight tunnel where it crosses underneath the Chicago River. Chicago River floods into the tunnel system. Tunnel system floods throughout downtown. I believe the total damage ended up being several billion dollars. Uh, I was in Urbana-Champaign. We watched it unfold on TV, and we just couldn't even believe what we were watching. Um, much to the Field Museum's good luck, it turns out that I'm thinking it's because when they had the initial train tracks that were creating the site, there was probably a slight elevation so that they could build up kind of like a pyramid. Um, so we did not get water. It stopped at about Columbus. There are still some engineers at the museum that were there back in 1992 that say that they were literally there kind of on hands and knees watching and just sort of praying, you know, that it stopped and it stopped. They sealed it up, which is what pretty much everybody was doing back then following this event. And it was, I think also one more way that the museum then cut off itself from this history. So, you know, there was, this old, you know, freight tunnel system that was like part of Chicago's kind of legend and lore. And for a long time, you could walk right, right into it from the basement of the Field Museum. This is where our central plant is. And then flood, they sealed it up. And now it's just, if you're lucky and get to go on a tour of the central plant, you know, hopefully someone can talk to you a little bit about it. And then voila, this was a couple of months after I started. I started in uh, August of 1997. And it looked like this, except there was no grass. It was just all sort of like uh, kind of roughed up dirt and everything else that they tore up. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause just in case at this point there are any questions. Um, so if you've got uh, one or two and would like to zap them at me, I do see that there is um, q and I don't think this one is for me, but if you've uh, Got a question, want to take a break? This is a great time to do it. Otherwise, we can keep going. There's plenty of time at the end as well.
I don't have any polls or quizzes, sorry. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. If you have anything that really strikes you and you really are hoping to get an answer, feel feel free to ping something in the chat. I'm, I'm very flexible and just happy everybody is here. Um, okay, so here is 1998. We have our new museum campus park. The focus has been, you know, really uh, connecting the cultural institutions, which was long overdue and a fantastic thing. They gave us this sort of lovely underpass tunnel system that, uh, you know, you no longer need to cross Lakeshore Drive at grade. Uh, that's a great thing. I will tell you on my interview to the Field Museum, I rode my bike and I did not get that memo and I came from the other direction and I crossed Lakeshore Drive. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> I highly recommend not making that mistake. So, sorry, I lost my control. Um, 2012, 2012 after uh, a couple of years actually of people that were in, you know, we have botany departments, we have uh, paleobotanists, we have ecologists, we have so many wonderful people that work at the Field Museum, you know, natural history exhibitions. And people kept saying like, why don't you have some landscaping that kind of reflects your role as a natural history museum? And we thought that was, actually kind of a dandy idea. So uh, the green team, a greener field, kind of took it on itself to make this like its big project. And we spent a couple of years um, finding stakeholders and trying to get an understanding for, you know, why the landscaping was the way it was and what we could do, you know, sort of as, as interested staff to make it better. And the idea of a staff community garden was kind of like the overwhelming winner for, you know, like a starting point. It was like a good, reasonable way to say, look, we'll get a lot of people outside. We know that there are some concerns about it's a highly trafficked area, but you know we we have people like if you give it to us to, to work with for food, we'll take care of it. And I think we kept up our end of the bargain, actually so successfully that people in the museum started to actually look at the rest of the grounds and say, you know, huh, maybe we could be you know reevaluating kind of the entire thing. And I will add because you know I haven't forgotten the title here. I know we're talking about soil. Um, on these terraces, these are actually uh, roofs of the museum that you saw some of those uh, actual sort of turf grass lawns on. So when we pulled the, the sod up, which had been there for, like I said, possibly 50 or more years, um, there was no dirt. I mean, if, if there was dirt, it was, you know, basically about an inch that was being held together with the roots. But what it looked like to me was a plant that's being kind of kept alive with miracle grow and water and a lot of kind of love. <laughs> So people were sure doing their best to try to keep it, you know, looking green and thriving. But, you know, ironically enough, because it did not have a healthy sort of sort of soil, you know, basis to it, it what, what that meant was it's very thirsty. And so, you know, you get into that cycle of you're fertilizing it because you want it to look good. And then that makes it thirsty. And as you make it thirsty, it grows, but then you need sort of more fertilizer because it doesn't have the nutrients in the soil. So um, it, just also because part of what I, I, I hopefully can kind of inspire and, and you know, kind of get people thinking about is, is really the, what the story is here is, is really how we almost use like soil and the ecology of the site to kind of leverage a much larger transformation of the institution. So while this is happening with the community garden, we actually start to roll the building through uh, what's called lead operations and maintenance. So this is the uh, the lead that's uh, leader leadership in energy and environmental design. It's often associated with brand new buildings that are kind of net zero energy. They've got solar panels. They've got uh, really like amazing green infrastructure, water retention systems, you know, gray water systems, all these kind of things. For uh, a hundred year old like natural history museum, people thought we were kind of crazy to be honest to even think about it, and. This project actually allowed us to like really get a better idea of how the Field Museum could fit into the whole kind of green building shift that was happening. So it turns out that even when you only have a, a small amount of, you know, sort of ground space compared to the square footage of the building, um, there's actually a lot of lead credits that we found kind of applied uh, to the landscaping. Um, at the time, we did not yet have uh, anything done except the lawns and this edible garden. So we got, I think, a, an innovation point for the staff community garden. But we, we lost out on some points for the other categories and the smart people in the building, not myself, other folks started to realize like, you know, investing in the landscaping might also be a way that we invest in the museum keeping. Um, it, we, you know, we, we managed to pull off lead gold, which was really kind of a feat nobody thought we were going to be able to do. 
Um, one of the points that we got, which for some reason kind of just really spoke to me because it, it took me, I think about 150 emails with one of the lead judges as they're called to argue why we deserve this point. And we had been do doing um, a project involving like an actual restoration where there was a burning. So, you know, you got burned off all the, uh, the old plants and then seeding and then working with community partners. This is just a smattering of, of different groups of them. Uh, I believe we used uh, Bobian Woods for the, for the credit. And I got emails back going, you know, what is this? Like, where's the receipt for sort of the open habitat you supported? You sent us a picture of what looks like dirt. I'm like, exactly, that's the point. Like, we're restoring the, the dirt. We're going to be removing invasives, working with people, planting native plants. This is the way it is supposed to work. And I, and I, I sort of had the little light bulb that in a green building rating system, when people think of protecting open habitat, what they're really thinking is that you kind of write a check to worthy institutions and organizations to be sure, like the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International. But a lot of the work that I found out that these groups were doing um, was just not, it wasn't local. And I thought, you know, this is a bit of a missed opportunity. Like it seems like this is something the Field Museum could help, uh, you know, do a little bit of uh, cheerleading and leading the charge for. And since we got lead gold exactly on the nose, I feel like I was honestly able to tell people that every single credit was the one that kind of got us there, you know, like the, the last person on the relay team crossing the, the finish line. So we kind of milked this one as far as, as, as we could get, it, frankly. And we did pull off the, the, the gold, which was great. I like this slide because this is actually a panel that is in our concert, uh, the entrance of our conservation hall. And you can see the internal struggle of kind of what we thought belonged and didn't belong. And I'm raising my hand going, you know, like plants, plants are in the exhibit, everyone can plant plants. And, you know, the people that take care of the facilities are like, yeah, but like, look at this chiller system. It's 250,000 gallons of you know, like fluid that we make ice out of. And we're like, all right, we'll throw it all in here. So I'm not sure we've inspired a lot of people to install a chiller system at their house, but I suspect we have done a pretty reasonable job on the plant front. So then came the rest of the grounds, because once we had like, you know, this little bit kind of carved out with the staff garden, um, people really started to, I think, see the possibility for, for where this could go. And so I thought to myself, okay, who, who could I talk to that's going to kind of, you know, re really be on my side here? And I'm like, of course, it's the folks that do um, bio blitzes and are big into biodiversity, cataloging and recording, you know, uh, life on earth. And I realized we had a really cool opportunity in front of us, which is that we often hear a lot of these discussions about the benefits of, of uh, native plants. And they're just kind of so obvious that I think it hasn't, you know, like there's no point to really challenge it. I mean, a native plant attracts a native pollinator. Of course they do, right? Um, what the Field Museum presented us with, however, was sort of like, you know, these you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like beautiful, like a golf course is beautiful, but this was like a lovely uh, June day. And there was nobody outside in these lawns. The lawns were, were almost like they, they were so well maintained. I think people were almost afraid to kind of use them. Like they had a look, but don't touch kind of aspect to them. Um, but we went out and this is uh, Jim Louderman, a, a lovely fellow. He's uh, one of the insect collection managers. And we went and I, I kind of learned, uh, he did this, I kind of helped push the cart. That was kind of my role with a lot of this stuff, honestly, just kind of enable the smart people. And we put the bucket traps in. We actually were able to find some funding to bring on a grad student who then uh, did the specimen identification. But you know what we're able to do with the Field Museum then is archive all this stuff. And so you can do um, wildlife monitoring all over the place. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But it really takes a natural history museum to be able to preserve the specimens. And in our case, we were hoping that we were setting the foundation for a before and an after. So at this point, we're still in the before. We're trying to make the case that this is a mission-based kind of project. So far, so good, even though the um, initial findings I thought were Definitely not going to inspire anybody. 80 species of flies. Um, 30 species of beetles sounds a little better than the flies. Uh, insect known to transmit pink eye. I mean, the best argument we could come up with with this is like, you know, would you want to bring your family to a picnic if this is kind of what they're going to have, you know, waiting for them? I'm, I'm not sure that sold anybody, to be perfectly honest. But 
we did do the projects and we did get a lot of buy-in from people who were curious, you know, like, so what, what do we do now? Kind of what's the next step? Uh, I worked with some people that were in our birds um, division. They started doing some out, outdoor monitoring. So this isn't just on the site, you know, this is like everything that they can see. And I think uh, the layman term description I got for the value of the museum campus, uh, I, I actually, I like this one because I, I do like camping and I've been there. And the person said like, well, you know, when you're driving kind of like around Route 66 and you run on, run into that one last hotel that's open and it looks a little scary, but you figure it's better than like crashing your car. <laughs> that was the museum campus habitat. So we said, you know, we can probably do a little better. But I, I always, that always kind of stuck in my head because it, it felt very relatable. So we uh, then made probably the most brilliant move ever, which was we did an RFB actually for just the landscape design. And Chicago is like load, I mean, the whole area I, I am sure is loaded with fantastic landscape architects. So a group, um, site design group, which is um, an outfit, they're, they're literally on like 8th and Michigan Avenue. So when you're up in their office, you're looking out at the museum campus. And I think that is why they put uh, such a powerful um, proposal together. I mean, we we got some amazing proposals. We would have been happy with any last one of them. And then we opened this one and we were like, wow, you know, like the, these folks get us. I mean, they they did just a remarkable job. So I wanted to show just a, you know, like they did make this emphasis of like, let's let's see what we can do to make these grounds really, you know, like come alive with with people, with visitors and kids. And, you know, the people that are increasingly living in the neighborhood, there's now, I think, 30,000 people in the South Loop. And there was almost nobody there when I started in 1997. And I went to high school at Ignatius, a little bit west. So I can absolutely say that with a straight face. Not a lot of people down by the Field Museum when I was growing up. Uh, so 2016, there's a little bit of a pivot in the way they're they're looking at the landscaping. As we bring in more, more audiences, we try to get a better idea of how we can make use of this. And this is on the um, uh, other side of the building here. We're, we're taking a look. It's just, it's just a different take. They, 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 they played with a lot of like really fun kind of ideas about different kind of regions that would be set up around the museum. I think where we, where we landed ended up being kind of like the, the way to go. But just to give you an idea of what um, you know, was going on. And, and I do remember laughing as I saw the, the fella on the bicycle and I'm like, as long as we get bike racks, I'll be happy. I do actually see people biking through the current uh, grounds, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there soon. Um, this was, I think, kind of where we had landed at the very end. Everybody seemed happy with this and now gets to kind of a weird tweak in the story. So this uh, kind of darker path that you're seeing that is on a, a little bit on the right side here, starting with the, the fellow with the stroller. This was an idea that we thought it would be a greener project if we uh, made a good effort. So it says on the, on the bottom, I don't know if you can read this, about a stormwater detention area. And then we started doing a lot of soil tests and we started doing a lot of drainage tests. And it turned out that because we're not really on uh, soil, you know, quite the same way that uh, an undisturbed part of, you know, the, the region might be, <laughs> it turned out that it was um, not not really going to be worth worth the bang for the buck to try to actually like capture the water because what was happening was it was just literally going right through kind of like the way like if you have, um, you know, maybe like gravel that slows down uh, water infiltration like underneath like a patio or something like that. So we uh, did start doing the plantings, though, uh, in that was uh, 2016, we started doing just a couple of isolated little raised bed planters and uh, the Science Action Center, which is uh, who I'm now uh, kindly, they kindly allowed me to stay on as an associate. Um, you know, they, they did what they do well. They, they made uh, a plant ID guide, which is designed to put in people's hands and like everyone from camp counselors to teachers and just interested folks in general so that people could start asking questions and get curious about the little plantings that we were starting to pop up everywhere. And then came this, and after this, there was no looking back. Um, this is a, a view obviously from the top, but this was sort of after they did the site prep. So they scraped off essentially 
it, it varied quite a bit because some of this involved like leveling as well. They did tests. We, this, the soil, what we found out that came back was we had a reasonable amount of decent topsoil. We had maybe about a foot and a half to two feet. And underneath that was about 30 feet of that fill um, that I showed you in the black and white photos that were earlier. And the fill, brick, concrete, wood, uh, burnt coal, you know, kind of you name it. And while we were doing this, this is where I met uh, a fellow who will be um, speaking and unquestionably more eloquent than I am about soil, uh, Mark Bramstedt. And Mark and I got to talking because everybody finds each other at the Field Museum. It's not that big of a place. And someone said, go talk to Mark. You know, like he, uh, you know, does soil sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, examples and experiments and demonstrations for kids. And I went to talk to him and I'm just like, you know, where did, where did this guy come from? Like, I wish I had met him like a couple of years earlier. Like it would have been phenomenal, but you know, uh, it's never too late, right? So he got this brilliant idea in as well that, you know, we did this baselining for sort of the uh, the insects, doing some bird monitoring. We actually even looked at, uh, 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 what do you call it, invertebrates as well. Not, not a whole lot of those to be frank. Um, and he said, why not do a soil core? If you do a soil core, then it will be able to come back and take another soil core once you have your whole project done. And this, this was actually before we had the money in place, we started making the plans. And I said, this sounds great. Like, you know, what do we got to lose? And he, you know, he came by and I learned what it was like to take a soil core. It was one of the most fascinating projects I've ever done in my life. Uh, and for no small reason that he, he goes down with the, you know, the core drilling apparatus. And once he got past about two feet, you can see on the bottom here, <laughs> you get to the fill and the fill does not stick like soil. So it was a bit of a dilemma, like, what do we do with this stuff? You know, we kind of packed it into a, a frame as best we could. I sprayed it lightly, you know, kind of like with a light uh, Elmer's glue solution. That was also fun. I'm like, what do I use? He's like, Elmer's glue. I said, really? He said, not a lot of it. He's like, you know, just a little bit of a spray bottle that'll hold it in place. Uh, the then the thing in the middle to uh, also call out. So that is uh, the botany freezer. So anything that comes in the building that is um, alive or potentially has organisms in it, uh, we put it in the botany freezer for a couple of weeks, make sure that's taken care of. We do the same thing in other parts of the building for uh, different specimens. And that's Mark in the upper left-hand corner who was kind of running some uh, some glue on the base that, you know, everything was going to kind of stick in as well. So this was such a, a fun project. So this was 2017. And I, you know, brought out this soil core delightedly at members nights. I brought it to donor events. I brought it pretty much anywhere. Someone thought it might be interesting to have this like strange guy show up with like, you know, this big, you know, crazy looking thing is about four feet all in. But once you started talking about it, people, I think, started to instantly get it. It's a, it's a fantastic educational kind of thing. Um, this is just a pretty picture of some of the some of the plants that we started getting in. Um, and and I, I popped this one in here only because when we started the project, we did actually have some people say, like, you know, you're not really going to get any butterflies here. And we were like, why wouldn't we get butterflies? They're like, oh, you know, there's planes, there's traffic, there's noise, there's pollution. Um, we got butterflies, I think they came with the plants. I mean, if I didn't know better, I would think someone I knew actually like brought some and, and released them. But we we had the monarchs pretty much from, from day one showing up. And they are really fun little little creatures. I mean, when they feel safe, they're 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 like pandas or something. I mean, they fly all around you, they bonk into you. They're they're just <laughs> for a city kid, it was just a lot of fun to see something that doesn't want to either bite you or your uh, parents worried you're gonna get rabies or something, you know? Got a cute little bumblebee. I mean, this this was this was like when as the project was really starting to like, you know, bear some some fruit. It was so much fun. And then we had the next big part of the project, which was <coughs> the Northeast Terrace. So this is the one where we said, you know, let's pick one one terrace and let's kind of like go a little bit overboard in the sense of trying to make it more like an exhibition. And the idea was we had been working with some of the people from our exhibitions department and we were like, you know, we have a botany hall, we have a conservation hall. We had an in development um, at the time, a Native North America hall. We had ancient Americas and this lovely Olmec head. That was another one of our funny moments where 
I think absentmindedly, one of the people said something like, well, could we turn the head, you know, like a little bit so we could make it part of something? And the, the look our, uh, <laughs> our facility director made uh, pretty much kind of put the kibosh on that pretty quickly. Uh, Omic head stays exactly where it is, and we just kind of worked around it. But we got busy while we were waiting for sort of like the next phase of the plants to come in, and we started working on these are flip books that are located all around the building. We were trying to sort of think like you showed up at the Field Museum. It's this big formal, you know, kind of like white marble. You know, it's obviously like Grecian inspired. And we thought, you know, these plants do such a nice job of kind of softening the edges. And if, you know, we can find a design and, uh, you know, make it really aesthetically pleasing here, then we think this is going to kind of open the door to people being more interested and willing to try them out at their schools, their churches, um, for sure, their homes. And so, you know, we looked for plants that, uh, you know, there was always kind of something in flower. We were looking for plants that might have potential um, indigenous like uh, medical uses that tied into our ethnobotany collections and other things. And so this was like another great kind of stakeholder project of being able to comb through the institution and find just people that were interested in being a part of this. And we had a, a really fantastic event and a moment with uh, folks from the American Indian Center. Um, who had already sort of been uh, brought into the process of overhauling an exhibit, which was also sorely overdue. And they came out, they brought like a really lovely crowd. We uh, did, a, did a planting. They actually blessed uh, the ground with some tobacco. It was, that was a, one of the most rewarding things I for sure ever got to do at the Field Museum. It was fabulous. Uh, this sign is still up and you can enjoy it as well. And then this is what we had in 2018. And left with the promise and a very sort of kind of skeptical uh, facilities, you know, department who said, so you, we're not going to have to water this. And we were like, hey, you're going to have to water it a lot, you know, just at least to get it established. Then we feel pretty good. We're going to really be saving on water big time once the plants just get a little bit of the roots established. And this is what it looked like on the other side of the building. Um, if you have been to the Field Museum any time in the past year or two, you know that like at this point, these plants have exploded. It doesn't look anything like this. In fact, I was told we had to water everything essentially for about a month or two, and then they don't water them at all. The only things that are going to get watered are uh, if we like transplant something new in because something might have gotten a disease and passed away or something like that. But we essentially are looking at two acres of drought resistant native landscaping. And I think that absolutely makes a lot of people happy. Well, also got some good, um, you know, kind of uh, cred from the, the sort of larger museum and um, just, I don't know, science climate community. Uh, we are still in was when the United States uh, withdrew from the Paris Agreement. And all these various actors in the United States of America said, well, you know what, we're still in to reducing emissions. And somebody said, you know, hey, can you do a field museum story? And I said, sure. And that was great. And then someone said, could you do another one? And like, what's a success story? I said, ah, gardens. So we did the gardens. This was on the We Are Still on homepage. It might still be on the homepage. Um, it's been there for like three or four years. They told us initially they'd like it for a month or two and then they would rotate. So I do feel like this is having its desired impact even far, um, you know, outside of Chicago and Illinois. Uh, iNaturalist. So getting back to, uh, I've only got a few more slides. Thank you everyone for bearing with me here and then we can do some Q&A, but um, impact in terms of, you know, what, what kind of actual benefits are we seeing to the biodiversity? Um, here is a, a map of the iNaturalist project that we started. Some um, fantastic coders that are in the uh, Action Center actually took my initial project and they were able to carve out this interesting shape the best that we could for the field museum that represented the landscaping. And just having the project up, um, you know, if somebody takes a picture, uploads it to iNaturalist, it will default to the project. And so this was, uh, I took this picture over the weekend, the snapshot. So we have now um, documented 219 species, uh, three, 299, 300 people have helped with the identification. 163 people have taken the pictures and uploaded everything. Um, I love this part of the project. We, we've also got uh, 10, actually, I think it's nine, nine native bees is what they say that we have up here. Um, that's, 
also, I think going to grow and grow, you know, we would also all love to see if we could, you know, ultimately get the little, um, you know, the rusty patch bumblebee guy. That would be so great, but you know, it's okay. It'll, it'll happen if it'll happen. And we did not stop there. We were like, you know, biodiversity, like overload at this point, it was COVID. We were all so happy to have something we could do outside. So uh, we worked again with the lovely folks in my birds uh, division and we uh, got purple martin houses up. This, I can't even tell you because of COVID, how crazy this was. We had everybody on board to do this big event and our Purple Martin houses showed up at like 18 separate shipments. So there was a little bit of like a, you know, gasp and like make sure all the parts were there, but everything is uh, turned out great. We are still waiting for Purple Martins. If you know any, let them know, you know, like vacancies are here. We'll get them eventually. Still feeling very good about that. Um, the bird and the other great thing about this is that you know the plan is to have, you know, actual uh, ornithologists out there like banding the birds, and you know th there will be real science that comes out of this project, which I'm real happy about. Um, we also, you know, one of the final frontiers at the Field Museum is you get your own microsite on the website. That is the sign you have arrived. Um, so we now have our own Rice Native Gardens uh, webpage, and so you can see. There'll be, you know, kind of like events, uh, stewardship opportunities, things like that, that'll pop up on this page. Um, here's just a couple of the current um, things that we're highlighting. So this is staff that we're doing sort of a restoration uh, kind of project. And that's been, a, you know, all, all of us who, who just love, you know, to have an opportunity to get outside and, you know, like get our fingers in the dirt. This has been such a great project they have going on. Uh, that's a uh, good good friend I got to work with on this project. He, he's just so smart and remarkable about a million things. Um, Eli Suzukovich is, um, he was like our liaison with the American Indian Center. He's an uh, ethnobotanist, uh, PhD. He teaches at Northwestern. He has done seed harvesting events um, with those communities. Fantastic guy. If you see his name pop up, uh, just go. You'll, you'll be glad you did. Um, tours. Uh, Everybody likes tours in the gardens. Go figure, it's a lot more exciting than the parking lot. So this was the Student Conservation Association. I hope I got the acronym correct, but I, um, in addition to the excitement of the only kid, I wanted to point out that is a bat house that is in the back. So we had a tween camp and the tween camp actually raised the bat house. That was a lot of fun too. Uh, and got to get back to the soil, you know, one more time. So this is um, an Action Center scientist, Erica, uh, in the back, and she was uh, teaching kids last year how to take uh, little soil cores out in the, you know, I mean, just do, do your heart proud, right? Like all these kids out there learning, you know, like things that were unimaginable when I was growing up. And then we also like the kind of cap of it all, we got a Menominee peace tree, which is like this extremely meaningful, like uh, it's a gift, it's a dedication. And this was grown in, uh, you know, Menominee lands in Wisconsin, which by the way, is where the wood for um, native truths, our voices, our story came from. I don't understand why we're not getting all of our lumber from um, sustainably harvest, you know, like Menominee land, I mean, they, we joked about lead. They're like, yeah, you know, we kind of have a couple of centuries of doing this sustainably. And I'm like, that's phenomenal. They're like, we're also lead, you know, like, they're good for the lead credit. They have the FSC certification. Um, and now, you know, we're just about to the end of the slides here. So uh, last year working with, I think that was Brandon and we had Will um, Kresner. Uh, sorry, I cut off my, my slide there. Um, Pretty sure it's Kresner. They are uh, fantastic environmental. Um, they do all kinds of services, but they obviously know how to do a mean soil core. Uh, they came out, we went to the exact same spot. Just a couple of pictures of the process here. And that's uh, Bill Kresner himself, who it's a family company. He's such a fun guy to get to meet. And we loaded up sort of yet another kind of, um, you know, casing so that we would have it ready to go. And voila, this one's a little upside down. So I'm gonna turn it around to make it a little more visible to show what we got out of this. But okay, it doesn't look exactly like the graphic panel from my opening slide, but you can kind of see that it's it's getting there, right? So the estimation, I would say, knowing how far we scraped down because we didn't scrape into the fill because actually that was gonna, <laughs> that was gonna turn out to require sort of like hazmat suits and things like that, just because that's what they make you do. 
Um, so what we're doing is creating soil here. We have at least six inches of soil that these plants built from the roots down. So it's going to take uh, quite some time, but actually I feel pretty good between the native plants that we've put out there and the fact that we also put a whole bunch of bur oaks because the bur oaks are the ones that everybody told us like these are the ones that'll get you those lateral kind of root systems that are so massive. It's an oak, you know, Illinois, we love our oaks and it's so important and so good for the mycorrhizal um, communities that build soil. And so there's the close up there. You can really see, I mean, those roots are absolutely going all the way down. We got them down. That's so that that's going down in just a couple of, yeah, just a couple of years, you know, that's already several feet and they're building soil everywhere they go. And they're also, why build a very expensive water retention system when you have plant roots that will do it for you? And I am actually done with the slides. That's, that's not too bad. We got through 60 of them in, in 50 minutes. So thank you everybody for um, being part of the slide part. And I'm happy to take any questions or anything else that kind of comes up. Yes, Carter, there's several questions about <clears throat> The core sample, but I think you uh, you did answer that pretty well. That it it's building, and so are you saying from 2017 till today? That's the amount of soil built. Is that how you're looking at the um, timeline? Yes, actually the core. So the coil, the soil core. I think we actually took in 16. We froze it, and then it was a timing thing. It, it stayed in the freezer, and then Mark was able to show up, I think, in like early 2017. So the, the dates are a little <clears throat> museum time is, is my uh, excuse I'll make here. Um, the plants did not actually go in that terrace. That was the very last terrace we did. And there were all sorts of challenges. It turns out that like there are not a lot of nurseries um, waiting to provide you 50,000 plugs of your favorite grass or sedge. So we ran into some uh, interesting supply chain challenges as they say. So that one went in 2018. So we are looking at 1920. So it's about, about four years. So you're getting, I, I would say conservatively, you're getting an inch a year, but I'd say it's probably a little bit more. That's a great estimate. Now, um, Angel had a question about with such crazy mishmash of, of the base fill, are there any worries about the stability of the museum's foundation? <laughs> <laughs> so the pilings, those, uh, the, you know, the footers that you saw going in, it, it, like early on when I, it was the picture of the lake. So that's 95 feet straight down to hit rock. So the building itself is pretty well propped up. I will say that I've never even seen anyone try to tell me how heavy the building is. Um, there's definitely a little settling here and there, but I, what I would actually say is building better soil is probably the best thing we can do to stabilize it because the the fill is 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 you know really it's like it's like gravel that shifts around, whereas you know good healthy strong soil it like you know it holds its shape. So. Uh, it's a great it's a great question. We do measure it. We have all sorts of interesting little lines and cracks. And it's a 1.3 million square foot building. You're going to get a few of those things, but so far so good. And Dan wanted to know if there are bats in your bat house. There is also a vacancy sign for the bats. Last I checked, <laughs> uh, I'm told this just takes time. You know, it, it's it's it is the. What we're really trying to do with the habitat and the biodiversity is also like we're, we're trying to plug in a gap on that, that whole sort of migratory corridor that's Lake Michigan. So we know that there's a lot of good stuff when you get sort of down south in the Hyde Park, um, South Shore, Promontory Point. We know that there's the Montrose kind of native plantings in that bird garden. Um, Northerly Island is, of course, you know, we want Northerly Island to also be like an anchor, but we figured, you know, everything else we can do to kind of help share the news and spread the word is good. So, you know, we can take our time with the bats. We're good. I, I also describe it as uh, that's our chemical free pest control. Right, right. Uh, Rebecca wants to know, uh, what is the difference between construction spoil and mm -hmm. construction debris? Yeah, so... Construction spoil, it's just literally a term that you run into. I don't even know if it's common anymore, but that's just what they excavate out of the out of the earth. And so it can mean 
it, it, it could be topsoil. It could be like, we get a lot of heavy clays around here. It could be sand. So it's just, it's just kind of a mix of stuff, you know, and it, it's, you know, in some parts, it's one thing in some parts, it's another um, construction debris. On the other hand, that's like when, when a building falls apart is torn down in the case of the Chicago fire, it, there absolutely was a lot of debris and, and rubble. Um, what I was told, and there, there are actually some very good maps that I was able to find <clears throat> all of the Chicago fire uh, rubble that they were able to salvage it didn't even fill, I would say, an eighth of Grant Park. So that's that's just how much space there was to fill, though. I think it, it, that's not a reflection of how small the fire was, just how deep the water was to, to get it sort of at, at level with the with the ground. And they also used a lot of that material to uh, firm, you know, shore up the mouth of the river, because I guess the, the river back then, you know, like the opening shifted around and changed depending on the weather. And so they use that sort of opportunity to basically like kind of stabilize it and make the port a lot more reliable. And Patricia wants to know which soil amendments were added to the soil before planting. That is a bit of a secret sauce that I was not privy to from our landscape architect. I was told they didn't need necessarily that much. It turned out we had relatively good soil that was kind of on the top. Um, but I have no doubt they were adding, you know, all kinds of organic matter to, to whatever they planted. And they also, they were doing soil tests throughout. I mean, these, these folks are, you know, the utmost in professionals. They, they, they've done, I don't know if they've done actual brownfield remediations, but they've done some sort of like converting old quarries and things like that to these kind of landscapes. So they're very, very good at, at, at what they're doing. I, I truthfully uh, apologize. I don't know exactly what they what they popped in there. And Jim wants to know, have you done any follow-up surveys of resident species, insects and other animals? Um, <clears throat> I hope that we're gonna get to do it one of these days. Uh, COVID was a real wrecker for us. And it's, it's challenging, I guess, to, to do it to the extent that we did with the baselining, it, it will it will get done. But there was a thought of like, it's so much effort to actually do between the collection, between the uh, the species sort of preparation, you know, getting them ready for the collections, and then the descriptions. They figured like that's probably going to be another couple of years out. Um, I did forget to mention one thing, which is that we do believe that we have a fly that at least when it was uh, found was a, a new species known to science. Wow. And, and oh, then wow. <laughs> the fun, uh, f funniest, most unusual, uh, interesting thing I think I had ever heard, you know, I heard this and I was so excited. I'm like, oh my, you know, everyone's gonna be so glad to hear it. They're like, it's just a fly. I'm like, yeah, but you know, this is like such a cool thing to hear about. Mm -hmm. And then I hit the, the, the brutal reality that there's apparently only one um, expert in the world that has got the uh, background, skills, education, et cetera, that can describe this fly. And we cannot send it because you are not allowed to send it to, he's in Norway. <laughs> and you can't send it in alcohol because of the customs thing. Oh and so far, we haven't found anyone who has just kind of taken a side trip to Norway that wants to bring this fly. And I've heard he kind of might have a wait list, but it's it's going to get done. That's the great thing about a natural history museum. It's not going anywhere. This happens, believe it or not, all the time at the Field Museum. People find uh, species new to science, um, literally, if not on an annual, possibly like a monthly basis at that place. I mean, it's, it's 40 million specimens. You're just going to luck out. <laughs> yeah. Pam wants to know, did any native plants fail? to grow because mm. of the shallow depth of good soil? Yeah, um, I don't think so because we did, you know, we did make the, the, right, the right move of, you know, planting uh, plants that were, you know, they, they were big enough, they came kind of like with a pot usually with like a, at least, you know, a little bit of starter soil to get going. Um, but also we didn't make the mistake of trying to plant, you know, really huge, kind of plants where you you chop all the root systems out just to kind of move it. So like, you know, this is pretty common with like trees, you know, people, they don't realize how wide the tree roots are. They want a big tree for maximum impact. And then they, you know, lose 75% of the tree roots to kind of move it. And then the tree takes 10 years to kind of recuperate. So 
the bur oaks were certainly the biggest things that we planted and the uh, root ball those things came with was the size of that olmec head and maybe a little bit more. So could no, I don't, I don't think a single plant failed, I, I would have to say. Would you say what that head is? Yes, it's a uh, Olmec head number eight. It's uh, a gift from uh, Mexico. And it's, I, I can't remember if it was like a sister city kind of relationship, but it's it, it's an exact replica essentially of, you know, one that is that is in Mexico. And um, it, it, it's it's a, a huge honor to have one. They don't just kind of give these things away. It is, it's really? huge. <laughs> Wow. Um, Lee, well, Kim, Kim wants to know uh, a burning question for lots of us. Is there a plan in place to keep these native plantings going now that you're not there anymore? Oh, gosh, yes. There's a whole department that has been, so all those, like the kids you saw with the soil cores and Erica, oh, yeah, there's, there's the, the Science Action Center between the Science Action Center the staff community garden, uh, the, the botanists, like, you know, we don't, I don't think that we call the botany department at this point because they're research and collections and they're spread around a little bit, but we did like a stat, like even on like a 90 degree day, we, we did like a volunteer call and, you know, we get 15, 20 staff will just come out on their lunch break and they're all just in, incredibly skilled and educated about it. It's a great, great side conversation to just strike up. The bigger question is, can we get the park district to really embrace all of this landscaping just creeping out? Because where, where I start to kind of, you know, put my little thinking cap on is, I mean, if this is so great for the field museum and this is so great for retaining water and climate change and global warming and urban heat island effect, I mean, why don't we have these plants everywhere? So that's, you know, that's uh, version 2.0. <laughs> right, and maybe we'll take a couple more questions. Um, would bluebird houses work in these gardens? Has there been talk of that? You know, I don't know how, um, I have a friend, I, I know he gets bluebirds. He's he's a little further away from downtown. He's, he's near Rose Hill Cemetery. Um, it's a great it's a great question. I would not be surprised to see more and more things like that added uh, with time for sure. It's it's really it's just the appetite of the staff that are working there. And if you can find some folks that are interested and eager, there's not too many people that don't like birdhouses. So would not be surprised. That's for sure. Um, and one other question, one last question: Is there is another biodiversity survey planned? Yeah, so the, the last thing I had left it with, you know, people were finally starting to come back more after COVID. And I think there were there were just sort of questions like, you know, can we do more kind of like monitoring kind of events, especially in conjunction? So like we, with our um, fine friends at like the Shed, uh, Shed Aquarium has done more using iNaturalist like kind of targeted events, whereas the Field Museum's project has been just sort of like a slow creeping you know, kind of like Goliath that's grown. And the, as I left, like one of the things that I spent a lot of time with, with a lot of my good colleagues at the field um, is actually building more bridges and networks between the Field Museum and the Shed and the Adler and the Park District because that description I had of like when they started putting the roadways around the Field Museum, um, that really siloed these cultural institutions. They They really didn't work terribly frequently together because I think there was six lanes of traffic or whatever it is. So, you know, the fact that at least we're, we're physically connected is I think starting to get the landscaping, you know, it puts it in a different light. Now it's got connectivity. And um, it turns out that like during COVID, lots of people that were holed up in their um, kind of apartments and condos in the South Loop finally like, you know, realized like what is happening over here? And so, you know, we now have like this like really large kind of stakeholder group that has kind of adopted it. And uh, Grant Park at the moment, any anyone who is interested can weigh in, by the way, there's a Grant Park framework plan. It's the first time it's happened since I think 2001, maybe. And if you uh, if you Googled like Grant Park framework plan, you can submit um, just sort of comments, what you'd like to see. They're gonna have public meetings. It's, you know, they call that one Chicago's front yard. So it's really, I think they, they like it to be open to everybody. And it's, uh, I, I like to think of it as a more the merrier. 
Jean, well, can we sneak in just two little quick questions before sure. we close? Uh, Patsy Hirsch is asking, what's the process for fall spring plant cleanup? Are plants left so that they help build the soil? Yeah, we. Um, I, I I had to cut myself off on the slides. I I, I get a little a little crazy there. Um, I was going to show a picture. We have um, one of my I think smarter projects that I kind of came up with was uh, an operations manual for the garden, and it was literally just me having an excuse to reach out to all these people in the building and say, kind of what do you think? What's happening now? And so it took two or three years to kind of really finish it, but we got some really like absolutely fantastic written in stone kind of policies and procedures about like how long we leave the plants, um, you know, make, make sure to not like chop anything down uh, too early in the spring before, you know, all the little critters have had their chance to kind of get out of there. So we have all that stuff captured really nicely. And it's, I, I think if anything, the next thing people are thinking is when they can do like controlled burnings. Um, this, uh, this starts raising a whole different <laughs> sphere of questions. <laughs> Yeah. And then one last question. Uh, someone is asking, I read that it takes 100 years or so to make an inch of topsoil. What was done so you got several inches so quickly? I, I've, I've read the same thing. I, my understanding is that's that's what it takes if it's just sort of like, um, you know, un, un, undisturbed by man, shall we say. Um, ours, I think just what is different is that we are intentionally planting plants that, you know, they probably weren't native to that exact specific spot, but because we are giving them a, a very carbon rich um, kind of mass to work with. So even though it's not something I would want to sprinkle on my breakfast cereal, um, a lot of that sort of old construction or coal ash or whatever, it turns out that it's actually probably pretty good for the plants. You just have to have the plants. So I think we, we it, Maybe a little bit of like a steroid. <laughs> it's a little, a little bit of a, a, a super fertilizer, perhaps, is what we got going on down there. Thank you. Well, so many people. I go ahead, oh, Jean. You're going to say what I was going to say. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, so many people are saying thank you and that they're inspired to visit the museum and inspired to do things in their yards, which is what we like to hear. So we we uh, would like to thank you, Carter, for sharing your time with us, your story with us, and um, we hope to hear more about your activities in the future. And for the attendees tonight, watch for a follow-up email that'll be containing additional information and handouts about tonight's session, and consider signing up for the next session, which is going to be Mark Bramstead, whom Carter mentioned, um, what is soil? What do I need to know about it? You can sign up at our startinyouryard.com website or the Gail Borden Public Library website. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Carter. Good night.